thank you very much, uh, and congratulations on your election. What you may not have seen on that clip was the way Gordon Brown reacted as I spoke. He yawned with exaggerated nonchalance. He turned and chatted ostentatiously to the official next to him. He pulled his face into this rather scary, stretchy kind of grin that I can best describe as being like the cold glint of moonlight on a silver coffin plate. And then he started scribbling. Now, heaven knows what he was scribbling. Maybe he was writing out more IOUs. Maybe he was signing off on Jackie Smith's expense claims. Or maybe he was drafting emails for Damien McBride. But as I sat there watching him, I thought, this man cannot listen to criticism. I don't just mean by that that he can't respond to criticism. I mean he literally cannot listen to criticism. It's always been Gordon Brown's tragedy. Now, alas, it's Britain's too. Because nothing can come between Gordon Brown and the pursuit of a wrong-headed policy. He's emptied our treasury. He's exhausted our credit. He's dishonoured our nation in the councils of the world. And still he carries on spending, juggernaut-like, inexorable, insensible. He's going to borrow more in the next two years than every government since the national debt was instituted in 1692. My two little girls are going to spend their adult lives working off Gordon Brown's debt, and all because Labour would rather ruin this country than face down its last remaining client groups in the public sector. Shame on this Prime Minister and shame on this Chancellor who've diminished our country and betrayed our posterity. Let me tell you a little story that seems apt to our present discontents. The year is 1945. Clement Attlee is Prime Minister. And one day he is relieving himself in the gents of the House of Commons. The door swings open and it's the leader of the opposition, Sir Winston Churchill. Churchill spies the Prime Minister at the urinal and he strides purposefully to the farthest end. Feeling a bit standoffish today, are we, Winston? asks Attlee. No, replies Churchill, majestically unbuttoning his fly. But whenever you see anything big, Clement, you nationalise it. <laughs> and that's it, I'm afraid, my friends, as far as jokes go, because the sobering truth is that in 2008, Gordon Brown spent a higher proportion of Britain's wealth on nationalisation than Clement Attlee did in any single year of the post-war Labour government. And this year, on current projections, he will be borrowing more than Winston Churchill borrowed to win the Second World War with. With the rather obvious distinction, my friends, that we are not fighting the Second World War. On the contrary, our government seems busily engaged in handing away the freedoms that our fathers defended. Above all, our freedom to live under our own laws and our own people in our own sovereign parliament. you think I'm exaggerating, join me in a little thought experiment. Try to imagine that you firmly believed in a United States of Europe. You may not find this easy, but humanly, right? Because we keep on being told, don't we? We keep on being assured by Labour and Lib Dem politicians that no such person exists. No one wants a federal Europe. No one wants a European super state. It's all a fantasy, a false creation proceeding from the heat oppressed brains of madmen like Daniel Hannan. Well, just bear with me. What if you were this supposedly imaginary Euro-Federalist? What would you want the EU to do that it isn't already doing? What attributes would you want to bestow on it that it doesn't already possess? And when we put the question like that, we see how far the EU has already progressed along the road to statehood. It has its own parliament, where I sit. It has its own money, its own government, its own external borders, its own Supreme Court. It has its own driving license its own passport, its own flag. It even has its own national anthem, Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, to which we're now expected to stand to attention when it's played in Brussels. 
I used to find it a sublime piece of music. I'm afraid it's now starting to have the same effect on me as it has on Alex in A Clockwork Orange, and, uh, and for much the same reason, which is bad connotations. What else is missing? What other bits would you need to slot into the jigsaw before you could properly call the EU a state? It seems to me that there are four. First, every state needs a head of state. Second, a foreign policy. Third, a system of criminal justice. Perhaps the supreme attribute of statehood is a monopoly of legal coercive force. And fourth, the ability to sign treaties with other states. Now, just if you were this putative federalist, this imaginary creature, I suggest, my friends, that you would be feeling pretty happy with the contents of the European Constitution. Now, by grisly necromancy, resurrected as the Lisbon Treaty. Because this text slots those four outstanding pieces into the jigsaw. It gives the EU its President of Europe. It gives it its Foreign Office, its Diplomatic Corps, its Foreign Minister, its Embassies. It gives it its system of criminal justice complete with a European Public Prosecutor and a Pan-European Magistracy. And it gives it what lawyers call legal personality, in other words, the ability to sign treaties. Under this constitution, the EU will no longer be simply an association of sovereign states in free association, and rather will become a single entity with our country as a subordinate province. This is a revolution in how Britain is governed. But it's a revolution brought about, not as a result of social unrest or bloody insurrection, not as a result of defeat in war or foreign occupation, a revolution rather perpetrated by our own elected representatives, albeit in plain violation of the promise that they made to us when they sought our votes at the last election. We just celebrated his birthday, so perhaps you'll allow me to quote our national poet. England bound in with a triumphant sea, whose rocky shore beats back the watery siege of envious Neptune, is now bound in with shame with inky blots and rotten parchment bonds. That England that was wont to conquer others hath made a shameful conquest of itself. There are 646 members of parliament. 638 of them were elected on the basis of an explicit promise that we would have a vote before they ratified the European Constitution. Gordon Brown was one of those 638. He was at least elected by the voters of Concordia and Cowden Beath, even if he's made darn sure that nobody else gets a chance to vote for him. What would it say about the condition of our democracy if those MPs now denied us a referendum? And what would it say about us if we let them? Because, my friends, nobody has forced any of this on us. Each successive European treaty has been ratified by a freely elected British Parliament returned by our votes. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves, that we are under. And it follows that if we want to reverse that process, the first step must be to change the complexion of the House of Commons so that there is once again a majority on the green benches who believe in the independence and integrity of the United Kingdom, and that means a Conservative government. <laughs>